So, you know, as we are approaching the end of the year, I thought I might present this question to you. And this is actually the first part of this message. I'm actually uh, preaching next week as well, which will conclude uh, this message. But the question is, why am I a Seventh-day Adventist? And I thought since we are here at the end of the year, I wanted you to contemplate that question yourself. Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Why is it even important? Because as we approach this time period, we need to remember that, that uh, besides the fact I feel I have so many objects on the, the stage right now, <laughs> but we need to remember where we are in the, the stream of time. We need to remember why it's important that Christ says we know what, we, what a Christian should know. And so I, with that thought in mind, I want you to contemplate this for a moment. Does anyone know who this guy is? It's Larry Fink. You know who he is? He is. Who is he? He's the guy, he's the CEO of BlackRock. And it's interesting, does anyone know who BlackRock, what BlackRock is? I knew you would know. Okay, very good. BlackRock, well, first of all, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, he was commenting about ESG, and I'll explain that in a moment. But BlackRock is an American multinational investment company. It's, world, it's the world's largest asset manager. It, it possesses almost $10 trillion worth of assets in this year. It is the largest asset company. It, as a matter of fact, the past two years, it was buying tons and tons of real estate all throughout the United States. Did you realize that? Tons and tons of real estate, sometimes paying twice its value to ensure that they would get it. And that's another story that I'm not going to talk about. But he was commenting about ESG. And does anyone know what ESG is? ESG is environmental, social, and governance. What is that? It is the policy in which companies like BlackRock and the banks, and all the big corporations are all leaning towards. What that is, it's as a social credit score, it will determine how and who they do business with, and in the bank's case, who and how they offer loans. And it sounds ludicrous, and there will be some people that joke and say, oh, that's not true, but if you dig deep enough, you'll find that it is in fact true. But one thing, ESG, Environment. What is your perspective on the environment? Are you a good steward of the earth? Are you taking care of the earth according to the sustainable development goals by the United Nations? S, social. Are you a social justice warrior? Do you side with the local minority groups, the the LGBTQ community and, and all these other groups. Are you a social justice warrior? And number three is the ESG part, the governance. Are you a faithful supporter of the government representation? Are you a faithful supporter of the party? And if you dig far enough, but notice this is what he says. This is what he said this year says, people need to be persuaded to think a different way. Behaviors are going to have to change, and this is one thing we're doing. You have to, what? You have to force behaviors. And at BlackRock, we're forcing behaviors. You have to force behaviors. We're going to have to force change. This is the CEO of BlackRock, the company that is the largest asset holder in the world. But he's not the only one suggesting this. You know, we like to believe that nobody's going to tell me what to do, and, or maybe I'd like to see them try. But the reality is, think for a moment, the story in Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 6. 
The captives of Judah were persuaded to think contrary to what they knew was right. Does Revelation tell us that that's what's going to happen? They'll be persuaded to think differently. Does anyone know what nudging is? Nudging? It is a small push that causes, that changes behavior. Show people what good looks like an intuitive visual set of guidance to enforce, or I'm sorry, to encourage the adoption of new behaviors or modifying behavior. Now my question is, show people what good looks like. Who determines what good is? Jesus, but in this case, who determines it? Whoever decides they want to push you. And it comes from this idea of, of nudge theory. It's a concept in behavioral economics, in decision-making, behavioral policy, social psychology, and consumer behavior, and a related behavioral sciences that proposes adaptive designs of the decision environment. And notice, as ways to influence behavior and decision-making of groups or individuals. In other words, what they're saying is, we want to show you what good looks like. And so we need to think for a moment. Do you realize we've seen that done recently? During the pandemic. You know, we don't like to bring up the pandemic, but during the pandemic, did we see people persuaded to think and act differently? The answer is yes. For the sake of safety for the sake of buying groceries, for the sake of keeping your job, for the sake of going into a store. People were given, they were nudged to think a certain way, to think what was good behavior. And we saw the red dot six feet away in the store, right? That promoted good behavior. And so nudging is a part of modern life. But we need to think for a moment as I said, no one's going to make me say or do anything I don't want to do, right? But unless we know what we believe, and we know who we believe in, the Bible is very clear that he will make all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And so the reality is that unless we do know what we believe and in whom we believe, and we can defend it. We may be nudged right along. But the bigger question is, will we be able to stand by it? Will we be able, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, will we be able to stand for what we know? Jesus tells us we will be brought before kings and rulers to answer for our faith. Brothers and sisters, do you know what you believe? Do you know who you believe in? You know, it's like the song goes, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful Sabbath, for this time that we can come together and open your word. I just ask that you would guide me, use me in a special way, that I would speak your words, give me clarity of thought and speech that Jesus would be lifted up and your people edified in Jesus' name. Amen. So Seventh-day Adventist. Seventh-day Adventist Christian. You know, that name itself testifies to what we believe and proclaim. We believe in the creator of heaven and earth. He created the world in six literal days and he rested the seventh. And he even made a memorial of that creative work. And we are Adventists because we believe in the second coming of our Lord and Savior. That he's coming back for his children. And there are numerous signs given throughout scripture that show that his coming is very near. Friends, this church is a movement of prophecy. Why am I a Seventh-day Adventist? 
Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Now, I don't ask that question so we can become puffed up like the Pharisees and get this false idea that that the Seventh-day Adventist church has a ticket to heaven because we don't. It's our relationship to Christ that gets us to heaven. Or that we might tend to think that, well, our church is going to be the only one saved because that's not going to be true. It couldn't be further from the truth. Because Jesus said himself, there are other sheep I have that are not of this fold. And so we know that's not true. But if anything, we should have a humble spirit about ourselves. Because it is a privilege to be a part of the mission of the church. To be a co-laborer with Christ. To share the three angels' message. To share the everlasting gospel to the world a world that needs to know that Jesus loves them and that he's coming soon. So my question, do you know what you believe? Do you know why you believe it? Now, I'm sure some of you were born in the church. I myself was a convert to the church. I'm sure there are some of you here that are converts to the church. Maybe you're Adventist because you grew up Adventist or, or maybe it's something you've always done. Or maybe, like me, you joined a long time ago and maybe you're wondering, uh, I I can't really remember why. Maybe you're going through the motions without really thinking about why you do the things you do, why you believe the things you believe. Is it even important? What you believe. Several years ago, I was talking with this man about what he believed. And I said, so tell me, what do you believe then? I don't remember how the the conversation projected that way, but I said, tell me what you believe then. And he said, well, well, I believe what my church believes. So I said, okay, well, what does your church believe? He said, well, my my church believes what I believe. (laughs) I said, well, what do you and your church believe? He said, we both believe the same thing. And you know, it's kind of humorous, but the reality is how many people have no concept of what they believe. And that's why it's important, our scripture reading in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. It says, be ready always to share with anyone that asks. The Bible tells us to be instant, in season, out of season, be ready at any time. Our other scripture reading, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Don read this for us. It says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Friends, he has called us out of darkness. Anyone who has accepted the call of Christ has been called out of darkness. And we're called to be a holy priesthood and a holy nation to him. We are to be peculiar. Are you peculiar? (laughs) Not in a negative way. Do you stand out among the crowd? It's the gray beard. (laughs) I'm getting there, Harold. I see more and more gray coming in. But are you like Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, as they were there in Babylon, in the Babylonian courts, did you stand out? Did you stand out like them on the plain of Dura? Can people tell a difference in you and your behavior, in your words, in your conduct, in your life? Why am I a Seventh-day Adventist? First of all, because I believe the Word of God. I believe in the Word of God. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy uh, 3.16 and 17, 
all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Friends, I believe that the scripture, the entire scripture is inspired by God. You know, last year, year before last, I worked with this gentleman, a Christian gentleman. Remember that. He was a Christian gentleman. And he knows that me and my brother, we study together before we go into work. And he was talking about the Bible and he said, a Christian gentleman. He said, oh, you can't believe all the Bible, you'll be deceived. A Christian gentleman. A professed Christian. But my Bible tells me if I believe in what is written, I won't be deceived. If I know what's written, I won't be deceived. The Bible tells us in Psalms 119, 160, thy word is true from the beginning. It is infallible. It is unchangeable. And we are encouraged to study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, the Bible's hard to understand, but do you realize if you study, the more the Bible is made clear, the more you begin to understand as you open the word. Yes, I don't understand what I'm reading, but I'm going to keep on reading. But then that's when God opens your eyes. He opens your understanding to what you're reading. So if you don't understand, keep reading. He will open your eyes so you can rightly divide the word of truth. So many times, like my Christian friend, they take a scripture here and there and they divide, they try to, to wrestle it and twist it to their own destruction. And so we need to rightly divide the word of truth. Does anybody know what the Bible stands for? Basic instruction That's exactly right. Very good. Now, this isn't the legitimate meaning of Bible, but it's basic instruction before leaving earth. We are to create this, this character that is meant for heaven. And so this Bible provides that for us. But now all scripture, does that mean we can pick and choose? No, all scripture is given by inspiration of God from Genesis to Revelation. It's our guidebook through life to help prepare our character for the eternal kingdom. It's God's love letter to his children. It tells the story of the length and the breadth and the depth and the height at which God was willing to go to save lost humanity. Hebrews chapter 12, 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. You know you have hit the truth when you read something and it cuts to your heart because it's asking you to change. It's calling you to change. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Turn to 2 Peter with me. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 19 through 21. For we have... Also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that the prophecy, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see, the Bible was inspired by God to give them direction, to give us instruction. And it's not, it's not the, the will of men, but it is God who inspired every word. Now, what about doctrine? Is doctrine biblical? Is a standard biblical? You know, a lot of people in this day and age don't like a doctrine. They don't like standards. But Isaiah 28, verses 9 and 10 says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? 
them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. You want to know how to study the Bible? Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. You want to understand what the Bible says about different topics? Go here, go there, to this book and that book. Compare what the Scripture says. And those that want to receive knowledge, those who want to understand doctrine, are those that get past the basics, the milk. Paul talks about that. Peter talks about that. Getting past the milk, getting past the basic teaching, if you want further instruction, then get to solid food. Psalms 119 verse 33 says, Order my steps in thy word and let not iniquity have dominion over me. See, the word instructs us on what sin is. And he says, as we order our steps in the way of God, he instructs us and keeps us away from iniquity so it doesn't have dominion over us. And he says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. If we want victory in our lives, then we need to keep the word in our heart. Is the word of God in our heart? Is it ordering our steps in everyday life? But also I believe in the Godhead. Now it's true that the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible anywhere. But the concept is riddled throughout scripture, old and new. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, John tells us there are three in heaven that bear record. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And those three are one. You see, those three can be equally referred to as they. Those three are one, just like a three-strand rope. There are three separate strands, but together they're still one, one, one rope. And so it is the Godhead is three in one. And it's riddled throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Isaiah 48 says, Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, there am I, and now the Lord God and his Spirit hath sent me. You see, there's three and he goes on, he says, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the one that was sent, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teaches thee to profit, which leads thee by the way that thou should go. You see, there are three in one. Isaiah 6, 8 says, Whom will I send? Notice, he says, Whom will I send? Who will go for us? And so we see three separate persons in the Godhead, but one ultimate purpose and one ultimate goal. They're distinct and separate, but one ultimate purpose. And they said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And because of sin, that marred the image of God in man. But now they were united together for the restoration of that image once again in man. And the truth is manifest throughout nature that there is a triune God. Two are invisible. One is visible. It's scattered throughout nature. You know that science tells us that light, light is constituted of three primary rays or group of wavelengths. Each one has its own separate function. The first originates, the second illuminates, and the, sa the third co con consummates or makes it complete. But now, as we look at those three, it said the first is invisible light. It's neither seen or felt. The second is both seen and felt. And the third is not seen but felt. You see, we have in nature testifying to the Godhead. God the Father is neither seen nor felt. God the Son is both seen and felt. 
God the Spirit is not seen, but he is felt. And so nature testifies to it. The universe is comprised of space, matter, and time. Space requires length, height, and width. Each part is distinct and separate in itself. But if you remove one, then space ceases to exist. What about time? Time consists of the past, the present, and the future. Two are invisible, but one is visible. But if you remove one, then time ceases to exist. What about man? Man is composed of three parts. He's physical, mental, and spiritual. Two parts are invisible. One part is visible. So we see the picture of nature. The picture in nature shows that God is three persons in one. Jesus himself commanded, teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Revelation 4 and 5, we see God the Father sitting on the throne. We see, we see the Holy Spirit working, and then we see the Son coming to the Father. And what do the holy angels say? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, because the Father, Son, and Spirit are holy. Three separate persons in one. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. And so the nature of the Godhead and his person is forever shrouded in mystery. We will never fully understand it because we're finite human beings. But scripture says it, so I believe it. But also I believe in God the Father. Daniel calls him the ancient of days, the creator, the source, the sustainer, the sovereign of all. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up on his throne. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I believe in God the Father. But also I believe in God the Son. God the Son, the only begotten of the Father, he became incarnate, he became flesh and dwelt among us. He's the express image of his Father, his love, his mercy, and his kindness. As a matter of fact, we read in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, God, was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him or by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. You see, friends, God the Son has always been. He is equal with God in power and authority. That's why Jesus would say, I and my Father are one. That's why he said in John 8, before Abraham was, I am. That phrase, I am, is ego emet. It means the self-existent one. And though he is fully God, he became fully man. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He did not take on himself the own unfallen nature of Adam before the fall and the temptation. Because Paul tells us, in Hebrews chapter 2, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels. And angels are perfect, right? He took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, and to make reconciliation for the sins of of the people, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure or to help them that are tempted. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2.
Philippians chapter 2, we're going to be starting in verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, Paul is talking about Jesus. Starting in verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And when it says that he thought it not robbery, it means he thought it could not be comprehended. We can't comprehend. We can't grasp how God came in the flesh. Does that make sense? He thought it not robbery. He thought it not easily for us to comprehend that he was uh, equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and he took on him the form of a a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess, I'm sorry, every knee should bow of the things in heaven and the things in the earth and under the earth, and that every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You see, he, came, he became flesh. He who was fully God became fully man. In Galatians 4.4 4 it says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. And so after 4,000 years of man's degradation and departure from God in Eden, Jesus, the only begotten, came in the likeness of men. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. We will never fully understand this mystery of how he was God Fully God, yet he became fully man. It will be the study of all ages, but that's why it's called a mystery. Paul says to Timothy, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. He lived a perfect life. He died a perfect death, and he was raised to life. And now he ministers in our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary. He has redeemed man through his infinite sacrifice, and he promises to come again and to receive his people to himself. But also I believe in God the Holy Spirit. He was active in the creation. The Bible tells us the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. So he was active in creation, but he was also active in the incarnation of Christ. In Luke chapter 1, verse 35, the Bible says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. So he was active in the incarnation of Christ. But he also inspired the Bible. As we read this earlier, it said, For prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But also the Holy Spirit offered, uh, filled Christ's life with daily power. In Luke 4, 18, Jesus talking, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance, to recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are bruised. See, the spirit was there to guide Christ, and now he is there to lead us and to guide us and instruct us and convict the world of sin. Turn to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. We're going to read verse 7 and 8. Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. Verses 7 and 8. 
Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. It's imperative for you that I go away. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And so he is there to guide and instruct God's people as G- after Jesus left. And for those who respond to the call, he renews and he transforms them into the image of God. And he says, how be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. And he shall glorify me and shall, show, shall receive of mine and show it to you. All things the Father has are mine. And therefore I said, he shall take of mine and he will show it to you. Friends, he is there to impart and to transform our lives. But the reality is the Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force. As some believe, he is not in it. He, the spirit of truth, has come. And he can be offended. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, And grieve not the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve means don't make sad. Don't offend the Holy Spirit. The question is, why did the Holy Spirit come? The Holy Spirit came because Jesus, in taking upon that sacrifice for you and me, he is forever linked. He is forever embodied in that body. The one aspect of his divinity that he gave up to be united with you and me is his omnipresence. He is forever in that body. He will forever bear the scars. And so that's why he sent the Spirit. Because through the Spirit, he can still use him as a medium to communicate to his people. uh, John 14, 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Holy Spirit will teach us all things. He will bring things to your remembrance. Now, can the Holy Spirit bring anything to your remembrance if you've never studied it? No. So we need to study. We need to seek to know God more. And he will bring those things to our remembrance. But the Holy Spirit also extends spiritual gifts to the church. He empowers the church. He's always testifying of Jesus and of Scripture. He always leads to all truth and never contrary to it. The unfortunate reality, what we see taking place, unfortunately, in the evangelical world is they put a feeling above the Scripture. And the Spirit never works to counteract what Scripture says. We need to remember that God loves us. Jesus saves us, and the Holy Spirit empowers us. But also, I believe in creation. I believe in six literal days, God created the heavens and the earth, and the seventh day he rested. He did not work through the evolutionary processes through thousands or millions of years, but rather scripture testifies In Psalms 33, 6 and 9, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. It said he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Is an evolutionary process fast? It's not fast at all. As a matter of fact, one thing they fail to mention is that evolution always leads to devolving. It never leads to progress. But he commanded and it stood fast. 
God spoke the world into existence and every seven days, we are reminded of that creative power, that a threefold God was ultimately and intimately involved in every aspect of our being and our existence. He created this world to be inhabited and to be enjoyed by men throughout all the ages. I believe in the creation week, not just because scripture testifies to it, but because it gives me assurance that if God could create the world and everything in it in six days, then he could recreate me into the image of Christ. But also I believe in the nature of man. I believe that man was made upright in all his ways in the day that God formed him until he chose not to believe God's word and to follow his own path. In Genesis 2, 7, it says, God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. The two formed the living soul. The body and the breath together, he became a living soul. It's not body, breath, and a soul. It is the body, the breath, together make the soul, make the living being. They were created perfect from the hand of their creator. They were created in the image of God, both male and female, which those two are under attack today. But God created man out of love and for love. And with love comes free will and with the power and freedom to think and do. And though he was created in the image of God, when they denied dependence and trust in God, they fell from that high position. And that image of God that once shined upon his brow was lost in man. Now he was subject to death. And when man sinned, that image was marred. And he became mortal, subject to die. And that's why the Bible says in in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18, 4 says, the soul that sins, it shall die. But along with their fallen nature, their offspring would now be born with the same propensity. Now they were not guilty of sin at birth. They were not guilty of their parents' sin. That's original sin. The Bible doesn't talk about that. We are not held guilty for anyone's sin but our own. The Bible doesn't teach original sin, but rather they would be born with the same propensity to sin. They would be born with the same weaknesses and tendencies. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel 18.20 says, The soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. But the, righteous shall bear, uh, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. You see, it's, it's honestly the best analogy I can give. It's like an alcoholic. If your parents are alcoholics, or if, if your father or mother was an alcoholic, that does not mean you are an alcoholic. But that means that if you give in to that tendency, you have the great potential to become alcoholic because you inherit that tendency. You're not guilty until you give in. And so man had that nature, and that's why we need a savior. But also I believe in the great controversy. All humanity is involved. This struggle that took place 6,000 years ago, and there are only two sides. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 7, there was war in heaven. And now that conflict is here on earth. But that conflict began in heaven with a perfect angel that began to have an eye problem. And you realize the center of all sin is I? S-I-N. The center of all sin is I. Lucifer, the perfect angel, Isaiah records it like this in verse 12 through 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. 
I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sight of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And so he became obsessed. Ezekiel 28 tells us, you were perfect in all your ways till iniquity was found in you. It says your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom. Who corrupted his wisdom? He did by reason of his brightness. You see, he became deceived and deluded by himself. We don't understand how it took place. We don't understand. That's why it's called the mystery of iniquity. Because we'll never understand how a perfect angel became dissatisfied with his place and his position. He began to covet God's position and his power. But you know what he didn't covet about God? He didn't covet his love or his character. He coveted his power. And so that controversy continues today until the final culmination of all things. And in Genesis 3, when, when man surrendered his will to the serpent, they lost their first estate. They lost their dominion and they became slaves. They gave dominion of this earth to the devil. And he became Lord of this world. But it was for that very reason that Jesus our kinsman redeemer not only came to set us free from the clutches of Satan and from the wages of sin and the power of sin, but he also came to reclaim this earth because it was lost. He came to reclaim it, to bring it back because it is our inheritance when it will be purified. You know, in Genesis the devil used the serpent, the medium of the serpent. In Revelation, he used the dragon. You see, if you don't understand, the serpent is a deceiver. The dragon is a destroyer. If the devil cannot deceive you, he will destroy you. And that is his goal, to deceive and then to destroy. And that's why we must remember that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. But I believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. That Jesus lived a perfect life and he died a perfect death in our behalf. And he was raised the third day and having overcome death, and now he has the keys of death in the grave. And all who call upon him in faith and repentance are promised forgiveness and eternal life through him. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, actually turn with me there, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Starting at verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, but perhaps, or peradventure, for a good man one would even dare to die. But God commended his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the atonement. You see, it was through Christ's perfect life of obedience, through his suffering and through his death and his resurrection, that God has provided the only means of salvation, the only means of atonement. And that's why in Isaiah 53, 
Isaiah says, he was despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and we had hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Through his stripes we are healed. And that's why Paul tells us, Neither is there salvation in any other name, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is only through Jesus Christ. But I also believe in the experience of salvation. It's through faith in Christ's infinite sacrifice and the indwelling spirit that we are justified. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Friends, we are adopted as sons and daughters of God. And it is by grace, by unmerited favor, but we must experience that personally, individually. Romans 3.24 says, Being justified freely by his grace through, redemption, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Friends, he is called upon all of us. And as we hear the call of Christ, as we call upon him, we are forgiven of our past sins. And his perfect life is attributed to ours. And we are renewed in our minds. His law is written in our hearts. But friends, it doesn't end there. That's why it's important that we continue to grow in Christ. And that's where the process of sanctification takes place. Sanctification is the, the work of making us holy. Now, it's not about flesh perfection, but it's about character maturity. It's about growing in Christ. And as we abide in Christ, his victorious life ensures us of our victory. And as we commune with him in prayer, in study, in active service, we receive the power of the indwelling spirit to mortify the deeds of the flesh, to put to death the inclinations of our body. And we're given power to live a holy life. The image of God is recreated in our daily lives. We're to be no longer conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And as we become, behold, we become changed. And that's why Paul says in Galatians 2.20, he says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life that I now live, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. But I believe in the church. A community of believers Join together in worship, in love, and fellowship, and the proclamation of the everlasting gospel to preach to the world. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church as the family, as the royal priesthood, no longer literal Israel, are established upon Christ himself, carried on through the disciples, and carried on throughout the ages. It is the bride of Christ, and at his return, he will present it faultless, without spot, without wrinkle, purchased with his own blood. I believe in the remnant and its mission. As I'm wrapping this up here, I have this one and one more left. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see, the remnant, the last piece, the last piece which is exactly like the original. It is the remnant church. It is the universal church. It's composed of all who truly believe in Christ. And they keep the commandments. And they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And in the last days, 
when there's widespread apostasy, there will be a remnant that will be called out for a special purpose to share the three angels' message of Revelation 14. To share that message, and throughout every age, God has had a remnant, and once again, God will have a special people, and all are invited. Revelation 14, you can check that. We read that during Sabbath school, our three angels' message. But the remnant's mission will be to announce the arrival of the judgment hour to proclaim salvation in Christ alone and to herald the approach of the second coming and to announce the beast's apostasy and his mark. And they will warn the world to flee from the wrath to come. Friends, every member is called to be a part of the mission because we must be the church militant before we can be the church victorious. But also I believe in the unity in the body of Christ. The church is one body with many parts. All are equal in Christ. That's why Paul says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is bond, neither bond nor free, but we are all one in Christ. We're all saved to serve, and we are to serve and be served without partiality. Ephesians chapter 4, 13 through 16. Till we all come to unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro or carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men's and cunning craftiness, whereby men lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up into him, into Christ in all things. For he is the head, for whom all the body fitly joined together. And what is it to do? It's to edify itself in love. The unity of the church is proof that Christ is in the life of the individual. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciple. I long to see Christ reproduced in me. I long to see Christ reproduced in our church. Why am I a Seventh-day Adventist? Because I believe it is the most Bible-based church with a Bible-based message leading people to the only Savior that there will ever be to provide humanity the direction, the ark of safety in Christ in these last days. We're a movement of prophecy. We're a movement of destiny. We're not to be exclusive, but we're to be inclusive. We're not to be puffed up and proud like Pharisees, but we're to be loving and kind, exhorting and reflecting the image of Christ in all that we do and say. We're not the only church that will be saved, but we are to be used for a special mission, a mission that we're called and all are invited to share, sharing the three angels' message to the world, the everlasting gospel, the everlasting good news that Jesus is coming soon. As soon and very soon, he is coming. May we be faithful to this high and lofty calling. The world must be ready for when Jesus comes. May we be ready for our great God and Savior. But my question to you is, who will you stand for? What will you stand for? Father in heaven, we thank you for the grace in Christ. I pray now that you would guide us and lead us Help us to know that Jesus is our only Savior and that in him we have our life and breath and all have our being. You have called us not to be exclusive, but to be inclusive. You have called us to share a message to a dying world that you are coming soon and that you want as many as possible to be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.